Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Jamie Kelly, uh, co-founder and president of VRcade, and with me is Ivan Blaustein, director of product integration. Um, we wanted to kind of talk to you today about the future uh, and current state, as is our case, with uh, out-of-home virtual reality arcades. So the uh, quick rundown of the agenda of what we're gonna be talking about today. First, we're gonna give a little background about our company, about our system, and about what we're trying to do in out-of-home virtual reality. We'll talk about some of the advantages of out-of-home virtual reality, and specifically our system, versus a lot of the out-home VR that's coming out in the next few months. We'll talk about the content for our platform and for our system, and some of the considerations for content for arcades versus at-home. We'll talk about a lot of the challenges that we face in out-of-home, and with a specific focus of stuff that we have to think about that really people designing for at-home VR might not have to think about or might not have to emphasize as much as we do. And then we're gonna present a, kind of a, our vision for the future of virtual reality arcades and where we think uh, our company is going and uh, kind of VR LBEs as a space can tie into the future of VR. So quick rundown about our system. Um, nobody makes wireless headsets quite the way that we do, so we had to build our own. Uh, same with our props. Um, it's a motion capture based system so you get incredible fidelity, you get large scale ranges, um, no drift, multi-user, wireless, all of those benefits. And uh, we put markers on pretty much anything. So whether it's a hand, whether it's a foot, a gun, or a head mount, um, and we track it in real time. And we're striving to create a low barrier to entry so that anyone can just walk up to a place like Dave and Buster's and say, what's this? I, I have no idea what the technology is, but I understand the experience, and I can go and simply have it. Um, the quality that we strive for is extremely, extremely high. Obviously, this is technology that's very expensive, and uh, it should represent that in the final product. And the systems are deployable and turnkey. So absolutely everything from the operator station to the truss to the clamps for the cameras to wiring to the experience itself to spare batteries to alcohol wipes Everything is in one package that you get, and you set it up, and you just run it. And it's global. So we have systems and developers um, all over the world and growing very, very quickly. So we actually have a video of our Dave & Buster's deployment, and uh, we'll see how loud this is gonna be. But this is actually at Dave & Buster's in Milpitas. This video was taken. Um, you can see our arrangement, three monitors, um, a, a 15 by 15, one player system. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see how these people who've never played, in most cases, VR before ever, react to something like this. So it draws quite a crowd. And we had questions about how do you make sure that people don't run into walls or trip over things that are in the space. And we have an entire virtual, kind of like chaperone system, and it works very, very well. Um, it was one of our big concerns, and turns out that it's not that big of a concern. And you can see right here, people walk by, and then they stop, and they look, and it's this snowball effect. <laughs> uh, and like Jamie was saying, it was really amazing to see people who, who may have never heard of virtual reality or have any idea of the state of virtual reality that you know, don't know what an Oculus is, have never heard of the Vive, but can walk into the Dave and & Buster's and just say, what's that? That looks fun. You know, instead of going, going next door, right next to us, there's you know, the Pac-Man machine or the Resident Evil where they walk up and are looking at a screen. Here's somebody physically moving around, physically flailing, shooting and scared of zombies. So it was really cool and always drew a crowd and having that spectator view of the TV was always a big deal as well. And we also found that there didn't seem to be any sort of metric on gender, race, age, nothing. Everyone just across the board, whether it's this woman's playing because her and her husband got into a bet about which one was brave enough to actually play, she won. And uh, then you have you know, typical gamers who are just instantly in the zone. They understand exactly what they're there to do. They understand how to pick up ammo. And, and your performance, you know, actually, it actually affects it. 
So this guy's doing wonderful, and he's never played before. Well, I'll talk about it a little bit in the uh, content section of the talk, but uh, that accessibility, that it, you know, uh, an old lady versus a little kid versus a hardcore gamer can pick up this, and they know instantly how to play. There's no real intense tutorial. There are a few instructions you get beforehand. But once you get in there, you're instantly playing. You're instantly having fun with the system. And you, re <laughs> you really never know how people are going to use this stuff. So <laughs> durability comes into, into play quite a bit. What was the uh, charge? Uh, $5 for essentially a five-minute experience. And that was set by Dave and & Buster's. And that'll be kind of site-specific. And depending on the length of the experience, depending on the premium content or what content they're playing, but that's ultimately going to be decided by the facility that's running the arcade. So there's a number of advantages. And when we started this in 2012, um, the idea of having high-end hardware, we didn't even call it VR back then. Right? We just thought it was going to be out of home, eight player, wireless. And uh, one of the big immediate advantages was that we don't have to get the price point down so that we can stick this in people's homes. This could be something where people can go essentially rent. So bowling, uh, go-karts, billiards, all of those things have infrastructure cost and hardware costs. And it makes sense because so many people use it. And that was the same concept with this. So we are able to use the absolute best hardware. We're able to customize hardware. We're able to tweak hardware in a specific way that may have never been designed for that use and use it for this. We're able to cover larger spaces. Um, even back then, we knew it was going to be a problem if there was some sort of room scale VR for consumers. How are you going to deal with furniture? How are you going to deal with room layout? How is your fiance going to be OK hanging cameras and running wires? And all of these problems were going to come up, and they, in fact, are to a degree with the Vive. And if you just had a space, then it makes total sense. And then if you were able to make that space even larger and get space that even if you could deploy this in your home, you just don't have the square footage, it translates to the game experience one to one. It makes a huge difference versus using something like a control stick. Multiple users, because of the way that we designed it to be multiplayer, wireless, um, allows for two users right now in our system to walk around each other without any interference, 1080p, 60 frames per second. Um, and they're able to reach out and touch each other's props. We could track anything that we want from elbows to just the head. Um, and with wires, obviously, that becomes much, much more difficult, especially when you start getting into four player and eight player. And this is going to be, uh, from the beginning, easy access gateway. A lot of people don't know what VR is. Back then, they definitely didn't know what VR was. And now they're just starting to understand what it is. And anyone who goes and plays Time Zombies at Dave & Buster's has a very, very good idea suddenly of what VR is, what it could be, and you know potentially why they might be interested in having it themselves. Whereas before, trying to get them to buy a computer and trying to get them to try a Vive or try a, you know, anything is you're either going to get low barrier to entry and low quality experience, something like a cardboard, or you're going to have to ask them to invest in a lot of stuff that they have no idea if they even want it. And this is that nice, go ahead and try it. So talking about the content a little, that uh, content's something I focus on a lot at the arcade. And there are a lot of considerations. Uh, we have an internal game studio, because um, at the time when we really started this, there wasn't a Vive. There wasn't the Oculus touch controllers. That we were kind of the only people with a tracked head and tracked hands. So we, we were making custom content from the beginning, messing around with all sorts of different prototypes. The, the game that most of the people in that video were playing was our flagship game, Time Zombies, which is a, a zombie shooter. But it has you moving around to pick up ammo, and you got to be constantly turning, because the zombies come from all different angles, which is something that most people in arcades you know, don't get to experience. Usually, it's a straightforward experience. So we make a lot of content in-house, but we're also now that there are a lot of people making content for the Vive and the, the Oculus and for even the PlayStation VR, that they're kind of democratized in tracked head, tracked hands. So we want to support that. We want to bring developers in, have them create content, adapt their content for our platform. And so we have very, very easy Unity and Unreal support. It's designed to be uh, very similar to the way Oculus and Vive and uh, Steam VR have Unity implementation and Unreal implementation, uh, that we can just bring that content in. So the second game we actually launched with at Dave & Buster's in June was adapted not even from a VR game. That was from a straight first-person shooter that's on Steam. And that's called Zero Point Software by um, 
It's called Interstellar Marines Bullseye by Zero Point Software, a Copenhagen-based studio. And that was just a first-person shooter. They gave us all the Unity source code. We adapted it for a, a target shooting range in our system. The other really cool thing about adapting existing content, people making Vive content or Oculus Touch, touch content and bring it into our platform, that there are all these limitations that you have to design for with going for at home. That talking to developers that, yes, they say, you know, the 15 feet by 15 feet is the max that the, the Vive system can go, but no developer really gets to, to design for that because you have to be designing for the minimum viable, which could be you know, really just standing. A lot of people, I don't have 15 feet of dedicated space in my house that when I set up the Vive, I'm probably going to have eight feet by seven feet, something like that. And I'm hoping developers are designing for that. So really, they have to be designing for the, the smaller spaces, but they won't for our system. So taking that same content that they had to adapt, that maybe it was meant for a larger space, but they had to adapt it and design it for a lower spec PC because who knows who's going to be playing it in a, a smaller space because I want it to be in everyone who has a Vive who might not have the full space. In our system, we will have the space. We will have the, the high-end PC hardware. Right now, we're, we launch our systems with a 980 Ti, and we're always going to be upgrading to the best graphics card available. You know you're going to have dedicated space of whatever the system configuration happens to be, whether it's 15 by 15, 30 by 30, hopefully up to 50 by 50 soon. So it's always going to be kind of the showcase platform of bring your game to our system, and it's going to be the best possible game it can be. And then another interesting element is thinking over the, the content that works and the core mechanics that work that, as I was discussing during the video, that you really can't do. There are so many interesting things people are doing with complex controls and new, new mechanics, new control schemes with two track controllers that are super cool, and we're so excited by them, and it's, they're amazing experiences. And the, the showcase here, awesome stuff from you know, the budget cuts, mod box for two that really excited me, that doing awesome things with physics and throwing and uh, interesting stuff that really for an arcade right now are tough, that we really need the, the experience to be immediately accessible, immediate. There can't be a long tutorial. It can't be complex controls. It's got to be anyone can pick up and play it instantly. So that kind of leads into one of the challenges, one of the current challenges of us installing these, uh, these VRcade systems and in arcades and theme parks around the world, that designing the game for that. That right now, uh, our core games are shooters. That nobody, you hand them a gun from you know, a little kid to an old lady, you hand them a gun and a zombie runs at them, they know to shoot the zombie. <laughs> that, that doesn't need to be explained. There's no real tutorial for that. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge we have that I, I think is just a right now challenge that I think as VR kind of matures and people understand better uh, the core mechanics, like thinking through what the Wii did with picking up a bowling ball that you know, everyone knows you push the trigger and now I'm holding the bowling ball when I let go. So there's going to be mechanics that are going to be more intuitive and we're going to be able to do very soon, but thinking through making super, super simple mechanics for the games that we bring into the arcades just for that you know, pick up and play possibilities. So a question we get a lot is that uh, hygiene. So these headsets are going on thousands of people. And compared to, you know, a gun or some other things you could do at an arcade that don't necessarily need to get clean and definitely don't get clean from our experience. <laughs> uh, but like, if you're just holding something, you know, you could wash your hands. This you're putting on your face. And it's definitely more of a, a kind of personal connection and it's really engrossing your face. And it can be gross if it's sweaty or if it's, you know, you're put on something, you know, people don't have wipes here. It's weird at conferences and expos, and I'm interested what's going to happen for at home, even sharing headsets between a few people, that hygiene is going to be an issue. So we, we've, from the ground up, our headset, you know, being custom designed is hygienic, that all of the surfaces are non-absorbent, so any sweat doesn't get into the foam. It's kind of a closed foam, so any kind of sweat or moisture just sits on top could be wiped off between each user by an alcohol swab that dries in like five seconds and completely uh, you know, gets rid of any, any residue. And then also, they, it's a Velcro. The, the main faceplate that actually goes on your face is just a Velcro. So we recommend they swap it each day. So it could be on a few dozen people, but then you know, even, even though it's being cleaned each day, uh, between each user, swap it off each day, use a clean, fresh one, make sure everyone has a clean experience in VR. 
Throughput is a major challenge. You know, we, we really want the, the high fidelity experience that everyone has kind of time to, to play and to really get the most of the system. But making sure that you know, the, the business model works for the arcade, that enough people are playing this. Uh, so things we've done to, to really minimize the wait time, things like uh, you know, instead of waiting for, for hours like you could do for some VR exhibits, you put your name down. You put your name and a phone number. We you know, integrated a waitlist system, very simple. We text you when it's your turn. We do other things of tutorializing the experience. The few things that we do have, like picking up ammo and just being able to move around, that we teach the user before they go into the system so that there's kind of immediate, you put it on, you're ready to play. Reliability of, you know, this is an arcade setting. It's a wireless component that drop proof. You know, can they be dropped? Do the, the marker posts that stick out of the headset for tracking? Those originally, the ones that, you know, they just sell with the standard system, snap. Those just can break right off. They're, you know, kind of rigid. We had to make flexible marker posts. We had to make a lot of stuff and kind of re-engineer the system to be reliable, to be uh, drop proof, to be, to kind of be rugged enough for an arcade setting. And then the last one is troubleshooting, which is kind of a, a cool thing about our system compared to a lot of arcade machines and arcade cabinets through history have been, you know, the time crisis game is the time crisis game. Anywhere you play, it's the same thing, and it's never going to change. That they install the VR uh, time crisis machine, and it's always going to be the same. It's a cool thing with our system that it's really a PC at its core running the experiences. So we can be connected to it. If there's a problem with it, we can remote in. We can control it. We can push out updates to the game. So it's a lot of things that we're thinking about in terms of troubleshooting and how to, how to make the you know, troubleshooting process better. And if anything goes wrong, that we're on hand supporting from anywhere in the world. Um, but that's stuff we're, we're very actively thinking about as well. So the future, uh, this entire company was built on this vision of create a warehouse and have eight players running around, whether it's Quidditch or Halo or Tetris, doesn't matter what it is, get people this amazing experience that for now and ever you can't get in the home. And then pop up these all over the country, all over the world, um, and then just start imagining what you could do with that. Uh, warehouse scale VR arcades, whereas right now we're deploying into these locations that have a small footprint that want something cool like virtual reality, where we test all of the guns and hardware and all of that stuff. The big goal is build our own, make them big, make them beautiful, um, and always, always have them be absolute cutting edge. So um, the goal is as a hardware developer or a software developer, someone would come to us and say, I want to premiere my stuff in your VRcades. And we might build an app around it or a game or an experience and then say, come look at this new graphics card or come look at this new haptic vest at the VRcade. And it's, you know, it adds to the whole eight players or however many players warehouse scale and it just keeps growing from there. And this is not for home hardware. So the scale of the experience always scales as in-home hardware grows, so does the out-of-home hardware. And even things like massive exoskeletons that give you perfect force feedback that you strap into, you're not gonna get that for your home. Absolutely not. Who's gonna make content for it? Who's gonna be playing with you? Who's gonna, who's gonna support it when it breaks? All of those questions get answered when you put it, you know, four suits of, of armor against the wall and you're like, you four are gonna be mechs in this game and you're gonna play with these four people in the capture volume and you four are gonna be in motion simulators over there, play. You're not gonna get that in the home. And you're definitely not going to get the social aspect. So the hardware and the software is built for specifically you can't do this at home. Um, and then, like I said, as new tech comes out, you can rely on the VR cage to just be this organic, growing beacon of tech. Crazy, crazy stuff. If we can find a way to make an experience out of it, if it's safe, if people absolutely love it, you can bet that it's going to be at a VR cage. This is it right here. This is the reason why I wanted to build this. So the idea of athletic esports, where your actual athleticism carries into a game, not just your waggle on the Wii, but your ability to run, jump, duck, throw a punch, kick, hold completely still, throw a grenade, call down lightning, whatever it is, all of that stuff actually carries over to some experience. And in that experience, you're able to play with other people and you quickly find out who's really, really good at playing Halo VR or Call of Duty or anything else. 
and then those people get invited to try out for, uh, to represent the team of that VRcade. So you'd find the top four players in Seattle, and then you'd do the same thing in LA, you'd do the same thing in New York, and you get the best of the best at whatever game we created, or anyone else created, and you have them fight. And because it's all digital, you're able to show what's happening inside of the capture volume, but you're also able to see through their eyes. And so you can spectate the sport that you instantly understand, whether it's people hunting each other, or whether it's people fighting off waves of monsters, or solving puzzles, and trying to do a room escape in VR, you understand what it is and you want to watch, which means now you start getting things on Twitch and you start broadcasting and you start getting eyeballs on it. You start getting sponsorship and you start building franchises. You have Seattle teams and you have Los Angeles teams and you build an actual platform for sports, sports that couldn't exist in the real world, yet still require a lot of athleticism and a lot of genuine skill. And it's something that people can understand when they watch. So if you were to go play Tron Disc Battle, if Ivan and I were going to play Tron Disc Battle, you'd know exactly what's going on. Whereas if you look at like League of Legends and you've never seen it before, you're like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> so um, there's this element of get people to watch this truly athletic sport. And this platform, Warehouse Scale VR nationwide networked, is the way that we would do that. And then the home mobile content synergy. So you're going to have, whether it's a mobile app or whether it's a game at home or something that you play on your PC or your Vive or your Oculus, you could have a version of that game at home. And what we, what we want is, we want the at home version of Halo 6 to be practice. You go online, you learn the maps, you play against other people, you know the weapons, you know the power-ups, you know everything, but all of it's practice compared to Friday night when you go to the VRcade and you're actually inside that armor, and you're actually running around 20,000 square feet fighting against other people. And this nice synergy that can happen between the two is beautiful in that everything from user accounts, so microtransactions that you might buy or performances that you might gain carry over, but also they complement each other so well. And with this kind of open system that we've created where we don't have you know, a strict proprietary platform, we can integrate with so many things. It is not a far-fetched idea to have Vive VRcade experiences. And if you have no idea what the Vive is, if you have no idea what the Oculus is, and you come and you play, and you're like, that game was amazing. And the attendant says, you can buy it right here in this box, we sell it. And you can take it home with you, and you can have this experience. And on Friday nights, at home, you can compete with people who are here. And just Th that level of exposure doesn't exist. The ability to get people that hooked on a system that tightly integrated doesn't exist, and that's what we're, that's what we're going for. And then microtransactions and props. Y y you might have no problem spending an extra dollar if you can get a shotgun to fight the zombies, or you might uh, really, really love the idea of having all of your data from your home version carry over to this one. So when you're at home and you get a new ax, and you know not only is this ax gonna be great in this game that I'm playing at home, but tomorrow I'm gonna go wield it in the VRcade, and I'm, I'm just going to destroy everything. Because you earned it at home, and it's incentive to go back. And uh, so those microtransactions that you buy at home can carry over, and vice versa. And it creates this wonderful link of it's worth it to get that shotgun or to get that power up, because you get to keep it for home. And it's an added value. And then, other ideas of creating our own props, so like an arm cannon that you would buy at the VRK, totally customize it, RFID, this week I'm gonna rent rapid fire, flamethrower, and ice shot, and I'm gonna go play these games with my arm cannon, and just bring it home. It becomes the bowling ball, it becomes you know, the, you know, the thing that you, you have at home on like a little stand, and you're like, that won me three tournaments, that thing is awesome, and it's mine, and it's a real thing. So with that, uh, we'd like to say that the future of gaming is here, not just for us, but for everything. This is an incredibly exciting time for VR. Just so happens that we started riding this wave as it was starting to exist, and to be at a convention like this where there's so many people making so many cool things is incredibly, incredibly exciting. And um, we are, I, if you want to talk about hiring, bringing people sure, on. Sure, yeah, I mean, just quick points on that. The, one, everything that Jamie just listed on the future is aligns with the original vision and is still our current roadmap. So everything he described is stuff that we're actually trying to do, we're actively working on, 
And you know, come talk to us, come email us, visit our website, learn about what we're doing, learn about where you can go, go play it. We're also, we're, we're hiring, we're looking for, for people. Our team is growing both on the internal game studio side and on the broader VR studios, network engineers, a lot of back-end stuff that we need and uh, a lot of other stuff we're doing. So check out the website, come talk to us. And we're based in Seattle, which, uh, <laughs> thank you, is, you know, uh, we just moved to Bellevue, so hotbed for VR there. Um, and if you're a developer also, that, like I talked about, we're looking for third-party content. We're actively working with a lot of developers that are here at this conference. And if you're making interesting content and interested in bringing it into the VRcade, come talk to us. Thank awesome. you. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was uh, really about our tracking system, and uh, are we just fixed with one, or do we use a bunch of them? We're constantly investigating uh, every possible tracking system out there for, um, you know, the, the main priorities for us are really accuracy and speed, that ultimately everything we do is driven by creating the best experience possible. So in our decision right now, we're using optical tracking, and that is our core tracking system, uh, high-end mocap. Mo you know, we're investigating stuff like Lighthouse, but you know, space requirements that really everything about what we're using right now, you know, down to streaming into the game engines, down to accuracy of many users at once. So the configuration we have right now is you know, our, our standard, but as new ones come out, we're definitely open to them. Thanks. Yeah. Next yeah. question first of all, up to the scale of up to Cool. Definitely. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, the biggest challenge. In general, the question was, what's the biggest challenge? Um, there's quite a few of them. Um, the biggest one is probably convincing, convincing people that this is something that, that will draw a crowd, convincing people that this is something that's worth their money, convincing people that this brand new medium actually is worth the 15 by 15 square footage. Being in our studio and trying it and understanding, like everyone in this room probably does, understanding what the potential is, it's incredibly frustrating when you go to someone who doesn't and you're like, seriously, believe me, like, they're gonna love it. I'm like, well, I don't know, it's a lot of square footage and, and, and we install it and it's absolutely wonderful. And it's not until people try it that they understand. And there's no way to market it, there's no way to, have a YouTube video that shows what it's like to be surrounded by zombies. We have an entire room full of people. They watch the video of someone else playing and like, ha that's funny, that's scary, or whatever. And then they try it and they can't handle it. And there's no way to convey that. So to be able to express how valuable this is in entertainment or on the VR studio side, which is our serious simulation side, how valuable it is in terms of saving money and not having to build foam models. Until people do it, they don't get it. And that's, that's difficult. Which really is ultimately a, a challenge everybody in this industry right. right now is facing. That you can't experience VR until you experience VR. That you can't be told how great it is. You can't see a video to understand how great it is. So you put the headset on and understand what you know, wireless full motion tracking means. That you can really crouch, you can jump, you can run around. That you know, me saying that to you means nothing compared to you putting on our headset and running around. So that's, that's a big challenge. Yeah. And we have one more minute. Yep. Right. Um, and like if you're in an arcade, um, do you have a you must be this high plane? Do you scare them away by having mature zombie content? Like how do you maintain the pop you have way more variety of right. 
So the question is, how do you accommodate for different size people, essentially inside of a VR system? The nice thing about our system is that it tracks your actual height. So if you're short, the zombies are very tall. If you're very tall, you're shooting down at the zombies. So in that way, it doesn't make them sick. Um, and then the headset, it's just a comfort thing. If it's not comfortable or it's too heavy, can you endure it for three minutes? Because that's about the length of the experience. So there actually is quite a bit of a leeway either way. Um, and there are things that we're doing in the design of the actual headset, making the lenses big enough to accommodate. We don't have IPD adjustment in our current headset. It's definitely something we want in future iterations, but just making the lenses large enough to accommodate most heads and most eye sizes. So that's something we're definitely thinking about. Yeah. So we are out of time, but if you have questions, feel free to yeah, come talk come to us. Yeah, come on up to us. Thanks. Thank you.